Um, Sandeep, uh, I have known him for many, many times and people in this room have known him for even longer. <laughs> Very long, uh, 50. And uh, the one thing I will tell the youngsters is that one of the things we, learn, we want to get this year's Nobel Laureate to visit India, you contact Sandeep. You want to find out what happened in the Nobel Committee? He is the one invited to receive, I mean, along with, by the Nobel Laureate to receive the award. Okay, he has worked in a wide variety of things. Okay, in uh, particle physics and associated areas, and today he will talk to us about stern like experiment and the discovery of the electron spin. Um, one thing special uh, in this year's visit is that uh, Professor Papasa has turned 80, and let us give him a hand for his happy birthday. Thank you. And uh, all his wisdom is. Uh, for us to absorb and so please uh, every year he comes one should talk to him and you know a lot of things i have i have picked up a lot of things and by direction my thinking and every time i have a problem uh, anybody to discuss he's the right person you go discuss he and deshpande are two people i always will find physics issues to discuss with and resolve problems okay so please feel free to talk to him thank you okay so uh, so i guess uh, as you grow old and uh, you can't think of new exciting things to do, uh, you turn to history because that, that's easier because it's all there and you just look it up and it's, you know, you don't have to work hard. So, but before I turn to this topic, uh, I want to have one top, one, one thought I could run by you. So, in 1990 at the Neutrino 90 conference, Leon Lerman gave the opening talk. And in that talk, he complained the theorists are lionized all the time, and uh, experimentalists don't get their fair share of credit. And the, he gave an example of uh, neutrino. So he said Pauli gets all the credit for inventing the neutrino, and then for me for giving the theory. But uh, actual work that made it necessary to invent neutrino was done by Charles Terman Ellis and collaborators. And it, it took more than 10, 15 years. And uh, so he said, you know, this is, this, nobody mentions this. This is not known to the general public at large. And that's, he complained about this. And so I try to, you know, redress this a little bit in some talks. And uh, actually, the story of uh, Ellis is very, actually, it's romantic, you might almost say. So the story is, in 1914, uh, James Chadwick, who would go on to discover the neutron, had just finished his PhD thesis with Rutherford. And he was awarded this Commonwealth Scholarship, which allows you to go anywhere in the world for, for one year and come back. So he chose Berlin to go and work. Now, that was an unfortunate choice in the sense, 1914, as soon as they reached Berlin, the war broke out. And so all the British citizens in Berlin were, you know, they were enemy aliens. So they were rounded up and uh, sort of house ar under house arrest. So, so the Chadwick was in this building and arrested. And he, was, he said, OK, I'll go on doing some physics experiments anyway, which he was able to do. And he, to assist him, he found uh, Charles Drummond Ellis, who was a sergeant in the army. And he, would, he had a career in army chalked out for him. So Ellis started helping him in, in this, whatever he was doing. And then, uh, you know, 1917, they were released and went back to England. Ellis also was British. Pardon? Ellis also was British. Yeah. Yeah, that's why he was in the, in the same place as uh, his interned. So when he went back to England, he said, oh, check the army and let me do physics. This is much more fun. So he joined uh, Chadwick at C Cambridge in Rutherford's lab. You mean Rutherford? Well, it, it, the lab, the Rutherford lab, he joined that and continued working in physics. And then uh, for the next, actually he did lots of interesting things, but the main thing was he and uh, Wooster, they worked on the beta decay spectrum and tried to prove that conclusively it's continuous. And actually it was not easy. It took 10 years. And uh, one of the problems was that beta decay spectrum typically had in exp those experiments had lines and a continuum. And so you could have various interpretations. You don't know, know what was going on. 
and they had to fight with uh, Lisa Meitner, who was a very good experimentalist. And uh, she said, no, no, you guys are wrong. It's a discrete con con spectrum, and you know, there's X-rays coming out and all this crap happening. And uh, so, they had, so they finally they did an experiment which was calorimetric. So they measure the total energy. There is nothing escaping. And then, then they found that you never get full energy. It's always two thirds or one half or something. And then, uh, even then, she didn't believe them. And then she repeated the experiment and got the same answer. And they said, yeah, you guys are right. This is continuous. So you know, without all that work, Pauli wouldn't have to invent anything. So that's uh, just, OK. Uh, by the way, it's, uh, this is a covered nicely in uh, Pice's book, Inward Bound. There's a whole section called The Life and Times of Charles Truman Ellis. It's very nice. I recommend it. So, so Stranger Luck. <coughs> so if you, oh, you open a textbook on quantum mechanics, and old, new, doesn't matter. And usually you, you find in the first beginning that in many modern treatments, Stranger Luck experiment is described, and uh, the results are described. And it's usually you learn that, oh, this is the classic way to do quantum mechanics. And this is the fundamental property of quantum mechanics, this twofold problem, and so on. And you also learn about why it's important in entanglement discussions and so on. So this is all usually in the first chapter in many books. For example, this list. Then you also learn at the same time that the experiment was done in 1921, published in 22. And a few pages later in the same books, you will see the discovery of electron spin is due to Gauss and Lundbeck. And uh, you know, if, if you think about this, this is strange. But how come you, nobody says that the spin was already seen by Stern So how can it be discovered then by 25, three years later? And they don't get any, any credit whatsoever, which is strange. So I mean, you sort of know at the back of your mind that this is, this is true. This is what textbooks say. And uh, I've been, I was teaching quantum mechanics for 45 years and almost never thought about it until recently. The last three years, I, I started worrying about this. Why is this like this? And uh, so in, while, st while doing this research, quote unquote, I found uh, a lot of other things. Well, for example, the original experiment, the troubles with the interpretation of the experiment. I mean, uh, obviously, if you don't say spin, there's problems. And uh, I discovered Otto Stern. He was a, just astoundingly creative guy, and he's just wonderful. So the Huxley data was very helpful in finding all this out. So here is a little bit of uh, his early history. He was born in Sorau, Germany. Now it's in Poland. And he got his PhD in 1888. Uh, sorry, 1912, and he joined Einstein in Prague as his first postdoc. So it was his first postdoc and Einstein's first postdoc. And, uh, and, he, he, and then uh, Zurich, I mean, uh, Einstein didn't stay in Prague very long. I think oh, less than two years, year, maybe a year and some months. And he went to Zurich, and then he, he, he joined, he followed him there. And he became good friend of Max von Lau, who was there. And then eventually many theories, including Pauli. And uh, these two guys, uh, Otto Stern and Max von Lau, they, when Bohr's first paper came out in 1913, they both thought this was crap. Uh, they, they said, what kind of bullshit is this? They don't believe any of this. And then uh, they were hiking on a, in a mountain near Zurich. They took what Pauli later called Utlischwer, which is a, it's an oath. And this is a joke on there is a famous Swiss oath called Rutlischwer, which goes back to William Tell. And that was an oath for the Swiss to free themselves from the Austrians who were ruling. They were part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So, so anyway, they took this, uh, this joke oath. And that this was the oath. If this nonsense of Bohr should prove to be right in the end, we'll quit physics. Of course, Bohr was right, and they didn't quit physics. <laughs> So he spent the warriors in the army. 
and worked as a meteorologist on the Eastern Front. By Eastern Front, basically, you mean Siberia. So he was stuck there. Then he came back and, uh, at the end of the war. And he was then in Frankfurt. He had a position in Frankfurt. And one of the first experiments he did was, uh, let me see. Yeah. Uh, he measured the velocities of molecules emitted from a heated wire. Sir, I have a question. Yeah. Um, his postdoc was in Smith Einstein, was TA. Well, it was not that specific. I mean, it was just his postdoc. They called him assistants in those days. But Einstein was not interested in experiments. No, no. So he was, I mean, uh, if you like, Otto Stern was trained in, in theories. And his, so all his friends were all theorists. So he suddenly decided? Yeah, yeah, he, he started doing experiments, yeah. Well, his uh, thesis was experimental. Ah. So. so what he did was he measured the velocities of the molecules emitted from a heated wire, which was a, then a classic way of creating electron beams and so on. And uh, actually, it was a very clever experiment. What he did was, oops, uh, yeah, he uh, measured the velocities by using the Coriolis force on the electrons, so rather indirect. But they had given more accurate measurements. And then he confirmed Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution for the first time. So he was the first one to check it experimentally. So this technique was invented by Mr. Dunoyer in, in France. But the completely exploitation was done by Stern in a, later on in many experiments. So in the end, he ended up in Frankfurt. And Max Born was his mentor. And uh, so finally, in early 1921, Stern thought he had figured out how to disprove the Bohr orbits idea, which he hated. In the meantime, of course, the Bohr model had already been embellished by Sommerfeld and others to include elliptical orbits, orbit length momentum. And Debye and Sommerfeld had described the orbits with magnetic moments uh, orientable in magnetic fields. And since orbits can only be in certain planes with respect to the field direction, this was called space quantization. And Stern thought that this he could test experimentally. Oh, by the way, the interesting side story is that Debye was Sommerfeld's student. And uh, Sommerfeld and Debye wrote separate papers in which they pointed out how you can Zeeman effect can be explained by the magnetic moment of the electron in the orbit. I mean, I don't know why, but they didn't talk to each other or something. I mean, they just they wrote separately. Anyway, then. Uh, so Stern thought he could do this. And in August 21, he submitted a paper to Zeitschrift for Physik entitled A Way Towards the Experimental Examination of Spatial Quantization in a Magnetic Field. Of course, he was hoping to prove uh, that this idea is wrong. And so I remind you a little bit of pre, I mean, sure, this is all familiar. Uh, so, you know, Bohr's orbits acquired orbital length and momentum, and new quantum numbers, L and ML. For a given n, l goes from 0 to n minus 1. And for a given l, ml goes from 0, 1, l to minus l. Total of 2l plus 1 values. And z component of orbital angular momentum takes the values plus 1, plus l, l minus 1, all the way to minus l. So for l equal to 1, you can have a 1, 0, or minus 1. Since the direction of lz with respect to an applied field is thus quantized, in this case, to 0, 90 degrees, or 180 degrees, this was referred to as, as I said, space quantization. And this was considered to be a crucial prediction of the bohr sommerfeld theory. So all this should be, everybody knows about this. So this, this is from Stern's paper in 1921. So basically, you just, you know, this is the standard classic uh, picture that you have, uh, all of us have. And uh, so, he, so he already had they worked out this beam technique, so he knew how to make beams, so silver atoms, and then uh, passed it through inhomogeneous magnetic field along this direction. And so the gradient along that is not zero. And then the force is mu z, db z, dz. And uh, you can work out in the elementary mechanics that the splitting between two values, L equal to 1 and minus 1, will be this. And uh, this is the distance from here to here. 
velocity, and so on. And the, the, since he knew how to measure velocity, so he knew that velocity is related to temperature from Boltzmann, so it's all fixed. And he chose some values, 10 to the 4 Gauss per centimeter, 1,000 Kelvin, and 3.3 centimeters. And he expected uh, the splitting to be 0.01 millimeter, not much, but enough. And uh, actually, when he wrote the but no, no. Uh, your writing, his writing. Sorry? Who's writing? It's not Stan writing. It's, it's, it's your writing. No, this is my writing. No. <laughs> I could have just taken the page from his paper. Yeah, I suppose. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so, yeah, there is an important remark to be made. Although in the Debye Summerfield explanation of the uh, magnetic. Uh, splitting or the Zeeman effect. And for, if L is 1, there should be three possible values of ML, plus 1, 0, and minus 1. And hence, three different orientations of the orbit. And, uh, and, uh, but in 1918, in a series of papers, he wrote three long papers in this uh, Danish journal. Um, he said that he was troubled by the case ML equal to 0. I don't know why, but he was. And uh, so he said, uh, this is, orbit is parallel to the magnetic field direction. He didn't like that. So that's unstable, quote unquote, whatever that means. And so essentially it's like a I don't like it argument, okay? And Sommerfeld wrote a very influential book in the next year, 1919. And he just copied this Bohr's idea. And so by the time the Stern wrote the paper in 21 with this proposal for the experiment, following this lead from eminent theorists. He also predicted, oh, there should be two, be two beams spread. So everybody said two beams. OK. In this paper, he already mentions that he and Gerlach have started work on the experiment. And uh, he realized that this is not an easy experiment. And he needs somebody skillful in experimental work. And he found uh, Gerlach, who was already in Frankfurt, and a superb experimenter. So by early 21, they already started on the design and the execution of the experiment. Now, they were not encouraged by any theorists whatsoever. I mean, even uh, Bond, who was somewhat, you know, sympathetic, uh, he said, this is what, quote from Bond, what said late, much later, in fact, it took me quite a while before I took this idea seriously. I thought that space quantization was a kind of symbolic expression for something which he did not understand. But to take it literally like Stern did, this was his own idea. I tried to persuade him that there was no sense to it. But then he told me that it was worth a try. So eventually, Bond came around and became an enthusiastic supporter of the experiment. Although uh, it's, uh, even Debye at one point said, surely you do not really believe that the orientation of orbits will be physically real. It was all you know, some abstract mathematical thing. Okay. So by the way, this is an amusing note on the, the style of work, how Stern worked in the lab. So, so he always had one, a cigar in one hand. He was smoking all the time. And he, and he didn't trust uh, to work with his own hands. He was not manually dexterous. So he would allow other people to do all the actual work. And if there's this thing, something is falling and there's a crash coming up, and he would just raise both his hands and stay away. He said, it's better to let things fall where they may rather than trying to prevent the fall. And he also describes in these memoirs that beneficial effects of a large wooden hammer that he kept in his lab and used it to threaten the apparatus <laughs> if it did not behave. <laughs> Apparently, it worked. <laughs> So the experiment turned out to be even more difficult than they thought. It took more than a year. And there were also, apart from technical difficulties, there were financial difficulties. So no lack of support. And uh, so they arranged public lectures by Bohr and other theorists um, with a charge for admission. And uh, believe it or not, actually people came to the talks and paid for the listen to the talks. So that was one way of getting them. And uh, oh yeah. A friend suggested to Bond, write to this Henry Goldman in New York, who had family connections to Frankfurt. So he did. Then he got a good response with some check for a few hundred dollars, which helped. And uh, this is the same Henry Goldman 
who started the Woolworth chain of stores and then founded Goldman Sachs. So interesting connection. So in the meantime, Max Born had moved to Göttingen, and Stern had moved to Rostock, which is in a uh, faraway corner of northeastern Germany. So that's where he had this next position. So Gerlach, poor guy, he would do the experiments in Frankfurt, continued, but then he would travel to Rostock and show the results to Stern. On one such visit, they reviewed everything, and then nothing was seen being seen, decided to quit. But there was a train strike, so Gerlach had to spend the night and then I went the next morning. And then by the time he went back, he said, ah, let's try one more time. So he did. And that was enough. It worked. So this was the published paper. And uh, these are the actual values they used. Uh, gradient of this, the magnetic field 0.1 Tesla, 3.5 centimeters. And uh, the splitting was 0.22 millimeters, much larger than he had estimated. And they saw two lines, and the value of delta z corresponds to a value of magnetic moment of exactly one Bohr magneton, as you would expect in the Debye Sommerfeld uh, expression. So it, everything worked, and the, the shift was larger just simply because they, they were using higher gradient. So they had confirmed the Bohr Sommerfeld theory, and Gerlach sent a congratulatory postcard to Bohr. Hello? Oh, yeah. Well, that's addressed to Bohr. Probably you could have just written Niels Bohr, Copenhagen, it would reach. And uh, this is the other side. And this is this, you say, and this is the, uh, the beam with no magnetic field, the beam with magnetic field, and split. And it shows clearly that the bohr sommerfeld thing worked. So, so uh, what happened afterwards? So, So this was regarded generally as triumph of the old quantum theory. Of course, there was no new quantum theory or quantum mechanics, so there was nothing else. And it confirmed the reality of Bohr orbits and converted the non-believers like Stern himself. No one questioned why there are two lines instead of three. Nobody said, raised this question. Uh, not even Pauli, Heisenberg, Bohr, nobody said boo. It's amazing. And there was an interesting reaction from Einstein and Ehrenfest. So they, they wrote a paper within a couple of weeks. And they raised a question. They said, let's do a semi-classical calculation of how long will it take to radiate enough energy to flip the spin, or flip the magnetic moment from one to the other. And uh, they found it was like a few hundred years. So they, they found it very puzzling. So the puzzle was that the amount of time spent by the atoms in the magnet was like 10 to the minus 4 seconds. So that was bizarre. So, so they considered various possible explanations. Although this was before quantum mechanics, or the concept of a wave function, or con concept of a wave function collapse, obviously this is sort of an early example or a premonition of that happening. I don't know. You can think about it. So actually, these are reactions to the experimental result, which are actually letters sent to them or something. So here is Sommerfeld. Through their clever experimental arrangement, Stern and Gerlach not only demonstrated ad oculus, means that you know something you see with your eyes, uh, space quantization of atoms in a magnetic field, but they also provided the quantum origin of electricity in its connection with atomic structure. Einstein said the most interesting achievement at this point is the experiment of Stern and Gerlach. The alignment of the atoms without collisions why radiative exchange is not comprehensible based on the current theoretical methods. It should take more than 100 years for the atoms to align. I've done a little calculation with Aaron Fest. Rubens uh, was an experimentalist. Uh, he did this uh, famous experiments, Rubens and Plinkshein, which, uh, you know, which established what the black body radiation law is through Planck. So anyway, and the, Rubens was just an expert here, a consultant, and said, Rubens thinks the experiment is sound, so there's no problem. And then this is the James Frank or Frank Hertz experiments. More important is whether this proves the existence of space quantization. Please add a few words of explanation to your puzzle, such as what's go really going on. 
And Bohr says, I would be very grateful if you or Stern could let me know in a few lines whether you interpret your results in this way that the atoms are oriented parallel or opposed, but not normal to the field. That's the ML equal to zero case. So as, as what he was expecting. So he, as one could provide theoretical reasons for the latter assertion. What they are, I don't know, I have no idea. <laughs> and Pauli said, this should convert even the non-believer, like Stern, non-believer Stern. Uh, Sandeep, can I ask a question? Yeah. You assumed the L equal to one, so why one? Well, I mean, they wanted to see something. L equal to zero, you see nothing. If equal to two, then you have to see four. Yeah, Five, yeah, yeah. Four. Yeah, four, four, according four, to them, yeah. Four. Yeah, four. yeah. So they assumed, yeah, they assumed L equal to one all along. Or L equal to zero, in which case you will Yeah, I know, that's exactly right, yeah. That's, that's yeah, yeah. But obviously, they're in the C, yeah, but when they see two lines, it's not L equal to zero. So that particular atom, maybe L equal to one was the ground state. Well, I'll come back to that question, okay? That's, uh, yeah, that's. It's silver, right? Yeah. It's silver atoms. Well, see, I, I should point out that at this time, the uh, Pauli exclusion principle wasn't known. So the fact that the there are closed shell atoms and silver has one outside closed shell. All this was not known. <laughs> so there, you can take any L you'd like and then see what happens. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, this, but this. Yeah, yeah. Right, right, right. I'll, I'll come back to this point. And the Rabbi said, uh, as a beginning student back in 23, I hoped with ingenuity and innovativeness, I could find ways to fit the atomic phenomena into some kind of mechanical system. My hope to do that died when I read about the Sunlight experiment. So, so he was now convinced that he had to do something different. Okay, so I, I'll, I'll repeat this. Incidentally, the fact of there being two rather than three lines, as expected in Dubai Sommerfeld, picture of the atom, was not raised. Not, not, you know, Pauli, Bohr, Heisenberg, nobody raised this question. It's, it's, it's quite amazing. I find that very amazing. Bohr raised it and argued it away. Well, because of him, they were doing this too. Yeah, exactly, right. right. So, so he, he misdirected them, exactly. Well, I'll, I'll have more examples of Bohr misdirecting people. So I'll come back to that. <laughs> okay, so the, uh, the fact that the values for the moment agreed with that expected for the orbit L equal to one and M equal to plus and minus one was accepted without question by everybody. Nobody raised this question. So the value for mu deduced from the observed splitting was exactly one Bohr magneton, as you would expect. By the way, my H is always H bar. I mean, there, is, there is no H. As it turned out, the presence of two lines, as you will as see, was due to two possibilities of the spin and the coincidence of the magnetic moment being same uh, as Bohr magneton what is the factor of two canceling the one half? Okay, we, we, we know all that. That'll, we'll come back to that. So although the Stern-like experiment was indeed the first observation of electron spin, it was credited as having confirmed space quantization and bohr sommerfeld model of the atom and not the electron spin. Okay. So <laughs> this is uh, not really that relevant, but uh, these guys, Friedrich and Hirschbach, uh, actually they wrote a Physics Today article on this. In, the, in 2002, they did a repeated stern galactic experiment in Frankfurt in their lab and uh, you know, repeated everything exactly the same. And uh, the cigar is, to, you know, that's an example that uh, Otto, Otto Stern, huh? They repeated it with the cigar. Yes, yes, yes. And, uh, well, the cigar is a long, I'll come back to that later if it, Well, this cigar is a, okay. So, Stern in his memoirs writes that, uh, you know, as I, as I mentioned, he always had a cigar in his hand, right? And he was always smoking. Actually, they both smoked cigars. And uh, so, f so, at some point, uh, he says, uh, Stern, that they were not seeing any effect and so on. And then, uh, and then he breathed on the plate, and suddenly the image appears. And he thought this was because, uh, you know, he was, as a lowly assistant professor, his salary was so low, he was smoking cheap cigars. And so there was a lot of sulfur. And so that helped, you know, deposit the silver. And uh, 
So when these guys did the experiment in 2002, and were trying to repeat it, so first of all, they talked to, who's the guy who invented the Polaroid camera? Land, Edwin Land. He said, he said I, he, he didn't believe it. This is bullshit, he didn't buy it. So it's sure enough, they found the same thing, but it wasn't due to the bad cigars. <laughs> so, anyway, so anyway, that's why that is it. So he, this article that they published in Physics Today is entitled, How a Bad Cigar Helped Reorient Atomic Physics, or something like that. Anyway, it's an interesting article, I recommend it. So uh, he's a chemist, Hirschbach, and he won a Nobel Prize in chemistry, but they were both uh, did the experiment. So this is a plaque in honor of Stern Gerlach in Frankfurt in front of the physics building. So let's go to spin. So electron spin, uh, so in, by 2425, the atomic spectroscopy was in bad shape. So we had uh, several problems. So one was the anomalous Zeeman effect, which was not understood. And, uh, and the details spectra of atoms, multi-electron atoms, was a mess, became very confused. So there were proposals for half integral quantum numbers with empirical formulas such as the Lande G factor. And actually, Lande G factor is, is quite fantastic. It's perfect, it works. But it's really data fitting. There was no theory, it just fitted data. So the first serious proposal of electron spin, oh sorry, Arthur Compton has raised the notion of a magnetic electron with spin, but nothing serious. The first serious one was due to Ralph Kronig in 1925. He was just 21 and he had finished his PhD in Columbia and was going to join Pauli as his assistant in Tübingen. He arrived, Pauli was away, and he talked to other people and learned more about the current data and he found that uh, if he assigns electron to spin with uh, h power over two, and which can take two values, then you can explain the anomalous Zeeman effect and fine structure, uh, the fine structure. So, but only he needed the magnetic moment to the spin to be this. So, so the mu L for orbital angular e over two mc times L, and this has to be g times e over 2mc, and so g is, has to be 2 to fit the data. So he said, if, you, if I take g equal to 2, it works. So, And uh, so when Pauli arrived the next day, he was very negative, very angry, and basically threw him out on his ass. You know, this is bullshit, nothing, this is all wrong, don't, don't, do, do something useful. And so that's it. And then uh, also, he got a similar response from Heisenberg, Bohr, etc. And he didn't publish his, his idea and uh, put his notes away. After the goldsmith Ullenbeck publication of the same idea, and uh, after it was accepted, I'll come to the why it was accepted, uh, then he published a summary of the objections people had raised. So, so, you know, I, I had this idea, but you guys said this, you know, so what can I, what can I do? So that, too bad. Uh, so I, uh, so one, of the, one of the objections of Pauli was that if you have spin h power over 2 as an angular momentum of a spinning charge, then if you take uh, radius to be classical electron radius, then the speed at the periphery has to be this so big, you know, 137 divided by 2 times c. So he said that bullshit. But of course, if you take Compton, if Compton radius, then it's fine. So anyway, this was nothing here, not, neither here nor there. Okay, a few months later, Gaussman Ullenbeck, who were students of Ehrenfest in Leiden, had the same idea at Crony. And uh, in contrast to Pauli, Ehrenfest was very warm. He said, oh, great, publish it. So they wrote it up. <laughs> so there was a factor of two, both Kronig and their idea had a factor of two problem. That if you choose g equal to two to fit the Zeeman effect, the normal Zeeman effect, g has to be one in the calculation of fine structure splitting to get the right value. So, you know, they didn't know what to do about this. So when, around this time, Einstein was passing through Leiden and he took his students to meet Einstein at the station. 
and told Einstein about what they were up to and so on, and the factor of two problem. So Einstein, without thinking, said, ah, oh, it must be a relativistic effect. Sure enough, Thomas showed it in a, almost less than a week after the publication of this paper. He said, ah, this factor of two is not a problem. We just do the Lorentz transformation correctly, and you have it. So that was solved. So that took care of the Heisenberg's objection. So this I already mentioned. OK, so that's nothing is a problem. So then uh, this was accepted, and you know, that's it. That's the end. So now uh, I come to your question. So when did it become clear that the spin invented by gauss mittelenbeck and Kronig is the same as observed by Soren Gerlach? So that's uh, in 1927, three young ex experimental graduate students. So two in Urbana and one in Aberdeen, Scotland. So the, the Scottish guy, Fraser, he measured the shape of hydrogen atom by doing scattering, hydrogen atom-atom atom scattering. And he found that there's no dependence on the angles. So it's spherical. And uh, then Phipps and Taylor did the stern gallag experiment with hydrogen atoms and confirmed that they behave just like silver atoms. And in, in both cases, so they both, both the groups concluded by this, of course, the, you have wave mechanics by then, so they can talk about Schrodinger wave function. And so they, they both papers said that the atoms in case of hydrogen and in case of silver were in the ground state, psi equal to n equal to 1, L0, ML0. And hence, the stern gerlach -like effect was entirely due to the spin of the single electron. It had nothing to do with the so-called space quantization or electron orbits in the atom. So by then, it was clear that silver and many other atoms with a closed shell and one electron in the outer shell had zero orbital moment. So this was uh, settled by then. This was the first clear statement that stern gerlach -like experiment had indeed observed the electron spin. This was the first time. So it took six years for the correct interpretation to come. When was the idea of shells became clear? At what stage? I think after the Pauli principle. So around 1925. 1927, it was clear? Yeah. I think so. I mean, I have, at least these guys were, were sure that that's the case. So by mid-30s, if you look at the old textbooks, you find that like Slater in 1935, they explained the initial confusion and the final clarification, giving full credit to Stern Gerlach. But eventually, there ceased to be any discussion of this detailed history in most textbooks. Uh, you can find uh, discussions by philosophers and of science and historians who continue to argue about this and so on. So, but that's not our concern. Okay, so I, I mean, I found eventually that the one way to say this is that in this, the, the difference from the usual story is that discovery was made first and invention was made later. Usually, invention follows. You know, invention is followed by the discovery. So like quarks invented in 63 and discovered in 68, 69. Charm in, invest, invented in 1964, discovered in 1976 in, when, you, when, you, when, you, when we saw the naked charm in the, this experiment. So this, this, this was the, the wrong way. That's why there was so much confusion. So the. One issue that was raised by David Bohm in his book, and again by Wigner a few years later, is uh, can you do a split, a st stern -like split beams and combine them to make the original beam again? Can you do that? And uh, that was answered in a paper in 88, 89, by a series of papers by Schwinger, Scully, and Engler. And uh, the title of that paper is, one of the papers is, is this, is spin coherence like Humpty Dumpty? And basically their answer is this. So remember the Humpty Dumpty is a riddle, right? Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall, Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty together again. And the solution to the riddle is egg, right? So in the case of spin, the egg can be put back together, sort of, but it's, there's some cracks remain. So what, what I mean is the, the answer they found 
was that in order to restore the original spin state to one part in 100, you need an accuracy of one part in 10 to the 5. So you know it gets harder and harder. If you raise this number, then this becomes even worse. So I mean, if you want to incre increase the accuracy, the, this has to be harder. So in principle, it can be done, but non-trivial. OK. Uh, so another topic, which is sort of related, is uh, what about free electrons? This is all atoms. So if the electron is not attached to an atom, can we still do a stern Galak? And the problem is that the uh, electron is charged. So in addition to the magnetic force, mu dot b, the mu z, dbz, dz, you have the uh, Lorentz force, v cross b. And uh, so I should, let me first go ahead. Yeah, so Leon Brillon in 1927, he wrote a couple of series of papers in which he pointed out that even for charged particles like electrons, we can still do stern gerlach But this was a longitudinal stern gerlach So basically, his idea was that you have a magnet and you shoot electrons down the, the, the axis of the pole. And uh, so you pass it through a region where the gradient is changing. So the force on the electron is changing. And you bring it to a stop. So basically, of course, you can't make it stop unless you switch. So but anyway, that was the idea. And so that way, you can measure the magnetic moment. So that was his idea. Now, when he published this, then the next Solvay meeting, uh, Bohr and Pauli were, uh, I mean, they, they, they saw this paper. They knew that what Leon Primorin came in to do. And, uh, he said, no, it can be done. No way. So, and the concept is meaningless and so on. So, uh, roughly speaking, the argument goes like this. This is uh, not the full, full fledged argument, but uh, since the divergence will be zero, so if one com gradient com well component is non zero, you must be, some other gradient must be non zero. So, let's say y. And then there is a Lorentz force in the electron. FL, the Lorentz, is this. And then that you can calculate, and this leads to the spreading of the beam along y axis. And then this must be less than the Stern Gerlach in order that you can observe Stern Gerlach. And uh, you can show that this condition cannot be satisfied by uncertainty principle. Uh, another, well, basically, what happens in practice is that you have to make the beam so narrow that the, it, you get diffraction. So, the, so you're in the diffraction peak. So you, you, know, you can't say exactly where the splitting is. So that's basically the argument. Uh, this is the, his, argue, uh, his idea. So this experiment is very difficult. It's never been tried, actually, in practice. So this was the story until uh, the late 70s when Mr. Hans Demelt uh, started doing experiments in Seattle. And they, were, they did experiments with what is called penning trap. The penning trap is a device which traps electrons in, uh, in space, in, in orbits. So you have a complicated combination of inhomogeneous electric quadrupole field and axial magnetic dipole field. And uh, so Demel calls this his way of measuring magnetic moment continuous turn galactic experiment as opposed to the original, which is dubbed a transient tunnel, like because the, the, the force is acting for a very short time in that little space. So, so this is a picture of what his setup is, and it's hard to explain. So, uh, so this is, if you could talk about electrons actually having orbits, and then this is the motion that you might consider. So this is the electric field here. This is the travels up and down that way. And then it travels in uh, the cyclotron orbits, the, in the Landau levels. And then this is the small correction due to magnetic moment interaction with the magnetic field. So, uh, so here is a 
more detailed picture of the positive charge, negative charge, uh, and uh, the electron motion is in this axis. And uh, well, it's more of the same. Anyway, the end result is that uh, with this setup, you can observe single electron for as long as you want. And uh, <clears throat> uh, months, if you like. And uh, continue. so this is the results. So for example, these are transitions between the Landau levels, the big lines. And the, this transition here is the mu dot b, the stern galax setup, the splitting here. Uh, so this is the time in minutes. And all this data is taken on a single electron, the same one. So uh, with this, he was able to do measurement of g factor of the electron to an accuracy of this. Uh, one part in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Anyway, and compared to the theoretical value, which is this, Kinoshita and company. And so the confirmation. And this uh, led to a Nobel Prize for Mr. Demelt. And uh, finally, so I think uh, one way of putting uh, this in perspective is, as somebody said, that you can never underestimate the, you should not ever underestimate the ingenuity of the experimenters. So, you know, they, Pauli and Bohr thought it could not be done, but they, he proved it can be done. And uh, so 1989, when he was awarded the Nobel Prize, uh, Piles was one of the few people who was alive, who was around in the 20s. And uh, he said that uh, the electron is free in the sense of intended by Bohr. This was one of the cases where Bohr was wrong. So that was an admission. So, uh, so anyway, this is a triumph of the experimental physicist. I mean, what you can. So anyway, the so the summary of this is is longitudinal measurement uh, instead of not not the usual one, which is transfers, is like Brino proposal. The detection scheme is different. You don't measure the position of the electron. Uh, you measure the frequency rather than position, and. Uh, greatly increased detection sensitivity, essentially free individual electron whose spin relaxation time is practically infinite. So that's why you can uh, keep it going for months some time. Same electron. And there is still some interest in trying to reconstruct an experiment more like the original stern galak or like Brino proposal. And the attempts are still going on. If you, if you scour the literature, uh, 97, 98, 99, People are still trying to come up with some idea to do these experiments. OK. So back to Stern. So in 1932, Stern decided that he wants to measure the magnetic moment of the proton, which was known to have spin half. So he had to use clever tricks because proton is charged. It would have a Lorentz force, so you had to worry about that. So what he did was he chose neutral hydrogen molecule, H2, which are two protons. and uh, of course, the electron magnetic moment is 2,000 times bigger. So that would overwhelm the proton magnetic moment. So the trick was to use para-hydrogen, in which the proton spins are par parallel, so their moments add up. And the electrons are in ground state of total spin zero, or orbital angular moment is zero, so there's nothing else. So all you are measuring is the protons, spin of the two protons together. And there is a small correction because the temperature is not quite zero. So there is rotational motion, and there is small angular momentum due to that, and small moment due to that. So, you, but you can do that. You can observe that in ortho hydrogen. So you know that. So you, correction can be made even that. Okay. So basically, you are measuring twice the magnetic moment of one proton. So when you made the when you announced that I'm going to do this, and uh, all his theorist friends, like Pauli, said, why are you wasting your time? We know the answer by Dirac equation. You see, 
one nuclear magneton, EH bar over 2 mc. As it turned out, he was vindicated when he found the value was three times as big. And uh, it had some implication later on, because when uh, in mid-50s at Berkeley, they were setting up to try to observe the antiproton, there was some worry that maybe antiproton doesn't exist because it doesn't satisfy power Dirac equation. So why should it exist? So anyway, uh, it turned out that it was okay. It does, does exist. So, so that's uh, Otto Stern, and he received the Nobel Prize in '43. As you notice, the citation does not mention the stern galactic effect, effect for the cont contribution to the development of the molecular ray method and the discovery of the magnetic moment of the proton. So stern galactic was not mentioned. So this is the, all the things he has done. Uh, first time measured the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. Uh, discovered electron spin about, without knowing. Experimentally tested using, yeah. He did a series of experiments in the late 20s and early 30s in which they measured uh, diffraction of uh, atoms, molecules, and so on. So that the Broccoli relationship was confirmed for many, many things and then measure the magnetic one of the proton. So this is the list of his accomplishments, if you like. Uh, actually, it was a good thing to work in his lab because more, many people who worked in his lab were assistants or postdocs, went on to win Nobel Prizes themselves. So uh, Rabi, Bloch, Kush, Segre, and Ramsey. The number of times Stern was nominated for Nobel Prize is 81, which is the highest ever. And he has been called the founding father of experimental atomic physics. It can be claimed that descendants of the stern galactic experiment are legion, including nuclear magnetic resonance, optical pumping, and so on. So, this, so the subsequent timeline for stern galactic was uh, in 34, after the Nazi takeover in Germany. Uh, so first he made sure that everybody in his lab, students, assistants, had secure jobs elsewhere, and so they left. And then he, he accepted one offer from Carnegie and came to US. Unfortunately, the lab was not well equipped, so he couldn't do any ex interesting experiments, and he retired to Berkeley and stayed there until he died. As for Gerlach, he worked on radiometric pressure and material science. In 1944, he became head of German nuclear research program and was detained at the farm hall uh, which was a famous uh, detention center for all German physicists at the end of the war. Um, and the, everything they said to each other in this, uh, where they were confined, it was recorded and is published. So, okay. Uh, so one more thing. So my own takeaway from Stern's career is this. It's okay to have theories as friends you will be familiar with what they're talking about, but don't take them too seriously. <laughs> Certainly don't pay too much attention to their advice. And above all, any experiment that can be done is worth doing. The, the Gerlach once said, there is no such thing as an experiment that is too dumb. And so Stern was, as I said earlier, strained as a theorist, had many close theorist friends, including Pauli, and would talk to them a lot when he had problems. But recently I, I found out from one of the CERN career issues that similar cautionary remarks were made by an ex-director general of CERN about the dangers of taking theories too seriously. <laughs> Thank you. Any questions? Who is the XDG? Pardon? XDG. Who is the XDG of CERN? I don't know. Actually, that article didn't give a name. Huh? He knows. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, 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 good. Good. Many XDGs, many XDGs, your friend, uh, 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 KDG also has similar statements that never take theories too seriously. Even the theorist DG? Yeah, yeah. The Sudhavara. He also said. Okay. Okay, Sudhavara okay, okay, said, okay. Uh, good. In Hawaii, I, I remember him saying, Good. Yeah, yeah, good for him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 isn't there an argument 
using uncertainty principle to say that magnetic moment cannot be measured? Yeah, I, that, that's what I was talking about. That's the Bohr Bohr Pauli argument. Bohr Pauli argument. Yeah. That's it. That's the bohr pauli argument. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, but it's for a charged particle, the magnetic moment cannot be measured. That was the claim. Oh, uh, the one which you are talking about, the radiation, uh, which is no, 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 electron, no. Free electron. Free electron. Free, electron. free charged particle. The magnetic moment cannot be measured because of the Lorentz force. That was the claim. So that was both Bohr and Pauli said that, and. Uh, but they didn't uh, anticipate Mr. Demelt. Any other questions? That was late in early 40s, no? What? No, no, no. That was 1929, 1928. That was at the Solvay conference. And uh, so Bohr made some remarks. And uh, the Rosenfeld, Leon Rosenfeld and uh, Heitler were supposed to be taking notes. And uh, apparently, they couldn't understand what Bohr had said, which is quite often the case. So uh, they tried to reconstruct what he had said. But apparently, Neville Mott was there, and he remembered exactly what Bohr said. And he went home and wrote a paper explaining what, what was in the paper. Then Mott and Massey's book on scattering had the same argument repeated. And they made even stronger statements than Bohr and Pauli did. That this, you know, there is no such concept as a many moment for a free electron. So, so they were all uh, misled, by the, <laughs> so to speak. Yeah. The formal idea at the yeah. center of eight, which was the correct one. Mm -hmm. and that takes into account the post spin. Yes, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. I know. Apparently, in uh, one of the original versions, we had an explanation that this may be due to the two polarization states. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Einstein thought it was too speculative and removing it. I see. Phenomenologically, we just. Yeah, I see. Actually, that is a. That would also mean discovery of spin in a way. Yeah, but well, I have a. Uh, I had correspondence with Pasta Ghosh about this and uh, passed it on to Pais. And uh, so, so, uh, so Pasta's story was that he was talking to Bose one day and, and uh, he basically said that, but you had this factor of two. And oh, yeah, it was the Raman's paper in which this is mentioned the spin. Or the, uh, and so he, he, he reminded Bose that, but you had, you know, you had this factor of two. So you should maybe you know mention it to somebody or something like that, and uh, so both said, yeah, it's but everybody I mean, it's, it's known, isn't it? That's that's enough. So, so, so yeah, he forgot. He didn't want to do anything. Yeah. Yeah. So that's you could say that it was discovered. Yeah. Yeah. But there, at least, there was no question about the missing ml equal to zero or anything. That was, <laughs> that was simpler. <coughs> so I can make a correction here, huh? Carlo. This. The source unnamed. I guess I can put a Rubia in question mark, yeah. 